Hello, everybody. Thank you, Clark, for uh, that kind introduction. I am so happy to be back here in Edmonton. Vous savez, j'ai eu la chance de visiter Edmonton à plusieurs reprises depuis que je suis devenu chef du Parti libéral du Canada, et c'est toujours un plaisir pour moi d'être ici avec vous. And since this is my first visit back since your provincial election, I'd like to once again congratulate Premier Notley on her recent victory. She, yeah, yeah. she and her team ran a strong, positive campaign, one that didn't take a single vote or a single voter for granted, and the people of Alberta responded to that. Now, as you all know, or may know, I'm working hard toward a similar goal. I hope to have the opportunity, as Prime Minister, to work with leaders like Premier Notley. For that matter, I'd be equally fortunate to have a chance to work more closely with Mayor Iveson and all other municipal leaders like him, leaders like you, all across Canada. I say that because I firmly believe that we're not going to get very far in advancing the interests of today's communities and tomorrow's Canada until we rebuild these important relationships. For me, that starts with respecting the experience, the expertise, and the leadership right here in this room. And we need to remember, that's not a novel idea. That's the approach that Paul Martin had back in 2002, when he addressed your federation and made the case for a new deal for Canadian cities and communities, affirming your rightful place at the national decision-making table. Quand, en 2004, Monsieur Martin est revenu à cet événement en tant que Premier ministre, il avait déjà commencé à faire de ce nouveau pacte pour les villes et les communautés une réalité. Son premier geste fut d'accorder un remboursement intégral de la TPS aux gouvernements municipaux. Aussi, dans le budget qui a suivi cette allocution de 2004, le gouvernement libéral a introduit le transfert de la taxe fédérale sur l'essence, une source de financement qui procure à ce jour plus de 2 milliards de dollars par année aux communautés partout au Canada. Mais nous voici une décennie plus tard et le constat est clair. Il y a encore, encore tant de choses à faire. Those liberal initiatives were important first steps in writing the fiscal imbalance with cities, but today our municipalities still don't have the resources they need to deliver the services that citizens expect. And our economy is suffering because of that fact. Municipalities, as you well know, deliver more than 60% of the services to citizens, but collect only between 8 and 12 cents on the tax dollar. And on infrastructure, even though the federal government owns about, has about half the fiscal capacity of all orders of government, it only makes 12% of infrastructure investments. That isn't sustainable, and it isn't fair. Our communities need greater support. I hear this every time I meet with municipal economic development staff. There's no shortage of great ideas, but we're falling short in giving our cities and towns the infrastructure they need to attract new businesses and new jobs. It's time for a new agreement between our municipalities, provinces, and our federal government. It's time for a new revenue source dedicated and delivered to local governments. Et même si le financement ponctuel peut être logique dans certains cas, comme c'est le cas dans les investissements de l'infrastructure des fonds Canada 150, nous devons nous assurer que ces fonds aident véritablement nos communautés et pas juste aident les chances de réélection d'un gouvernement actuel. 
And that means building out reasonable timelines to give communities enough time to review their needs, draft proposals, and secure local buy-in. And it most certainly means starting discussions well in advance of known predictable deadlines. No province in our Federation should be denied their fair share of available funds simply because Ottawa is scrambling for pre-writ announcements. Now, Mr. Harper and his ministers and his candidates running for election in your hometowns will tell you that current investments are enough to meet the needs of your communities. Well, even the newest municipal leaders in this room know that's just not true. Far from giving communities what they need, investment in the Conservatives' new Building Canada Fund was actually cut by 90% this year and last. Under the Conservatives, federal infrastructure funding won't return to 2013 levels until after the next election year in 2019. The flaws in the new Building Canada Fund, in how it was conceived, how it was announced, and even how it is delivered, could have been avoided. It all goes back to that idea of a respectful, productive relationship. All that Mr. Harper's government had to do was to take the FCM up on its offer to sit down and have a conversation about how best to design and implement a new funding plan. In the almost three years that I've been Liberal leader, I visited nearly 2,000 cities and communities all across Canada. Let me assure you, the municipal leaders that I've met have not been shy about sharing both their opinions and their advice. And when we listen, good things can happen. Last year, I congratulated the Prime Minister on his decision to index the gas tax transfer to inflation. And I will admit that this year, I was pleased to see him at least acknowledge the need for increased federal investment in public transit. But there is more to leadership than announcing new investments. As a leader, you have to make time for the things that matter. That's why I've made it a priority to visit so many Canadian communities and meet with leaders like you. That's why, as leader of the Liberal Party, I've been here at this annual convention all three years in a row. And it's why I will be here again next year, even if I'm Prime Minister, especially if I'm Prime Minister. As you municipal leaders, you shouldn't have to wait six months or a year to have your concerns heard by your federal partners. That's why I'm committed to holding regular meetings with municipal leaders. And I'm very excited to be leading a team that is dedicated to making sure that your voices and the voices of your communities will be heard in Ottawa each and every day. That's a team that includes Edmonton Councillor Amarjeet Sohi, Halifax Regional Councillor Darren Fisher, Pickering Councillor Jennifer O'Connell, and former Mayor of West Vancouver Pamela Goldsmith-Jones. There's Dan Van Dal, a former Winnipeg City Councillor, and Louis Brown, a former member of Regina City Councillor. And of course, former Toronto Councillor and current MP for Trinity Spadina, Adam Vaughan. You will all recognize one of our future candidates, Karen Libavici, former president of FCM, standing for nomination here in Edmonton West. And those, those names I just shared with you, those are just the team members who are here with us today. Dozens of the candidates running for the Liberal Party this year are municipal politicians. We're lucky 
to have so many talented mayors and councillors on our team, alongside accomplished municipal leaders like former Toronto Police Chief Bill Blair. Je me serais même peut-être mal senti à l'idée de voir passer du municipal, municipal à la sphère fédérale tant de gens si je n'avais pas été convaincu qu'aujourd'hui, plus que jamais, les communautés au Canada ont besoin de leaders locaux, solides et expérimentés, et ce, à tous les niveaux de gouvernement. Nous devons nous assurer que les besoins locaux sont pris en compte, que les priorités locales sont mises en œuvre et que le gouvernement fédéral fait face à ses responsabilités financières et autres. L'année dernière, j'ai dit que le succès de nos communautés passe par un financement des infrastructures substantielles, prévisibles et durables. Substantielles parce que les municipalités ont des sources de revenus limitées. L'impôt foncier, les frais d'aménagement et les frais d'utilisation que vous percevez financent les opérations, pas les projets d'immobilisation. Plus les gouvernements provinciaux et fédéraux vous aident avec le capital, plus vous disposez d'une marge de manœuvre pour boucler vos budgets de fonctionnement et pour livrer des choses essentielles comme les services d'urgence et les travaux de voirie. Le financement doit aussi être prévisible pour que vous puissiez financer les projets existants et planifier les travaux futurs. Un financement stable procure une source de revenus sur laquelle vous pouvez emprunter. Et le moment est venu de le faire, alors que les taux d'intérêt sont bas et la confiance de nos investisseurs dans nos municipalités haute. Enfin, le financement doit être durable, parce que vous ne pouvez pas préparer un budget réaliste ou élaborer un plan à long terme si vous n'avez pas un partenaire qui veut et qui peut vous apporter le financement dont vous avez besoin, aujourd'hui et sur le long terme. Those principles I enunciated last year in Niagara Falls have not changed. Substantial, stable, and predictable funding for infrastructure has been at the heart of our decision-making over this past year, and you'll see them reflected deeply in our election platform this fall. You'll also see a strong focus on the idea of fairness. For me, fairness is about making sure Canada's middle class and those who are working hard to join it can have a real and fair chance at success. It's about giving back to Canadians the same opportunities that our parents and grandparents worked so hard to give us all. We're putting that idea of fairness right at the heart of our plan. We've proposed a new Canada Child Benefit that will help Canadian families with the high costs of raising their kids. It's a plan that will allow us to do more for the people who need it by doing less for the people who don't. And we'll give middle-class Canadians real tax relief, $3 billion worth, by asking the wealthiest Canadians those who earn more than $200,000 a year to do a little bit more. We're we are proposing these changes because we believe that restoring fairness and reducing inequality is in the best interests of all Canadians. When our middle class has more money in our pockets to save, invest and grow the economy, we all benefit. When our middle class does well, our communities do well too. But that commitment to fairness doesn't end with Canadian families. The cities and communities that we call home, they deserve fairness too. They deserve a way forward that will grow our economy stimulate job creation, and improve the quality of life for all Canadians. That is fairness 
for Canada's cities and communities. So I'd like to share with you what our infrastructure platform is going to look like. There are four areas where we believe strategic investments can make a real difference. Number one, affordable housing. It is one of the most important challenges because it really has to do with our sense of home and place. Today, Canadians from all across the economic spectrum are finding affordable housing in short supply. According to Van City Credit Union, Metro Vancouver is on the brink of massive labour crisis because, of over, because over the next 10 years, housing will become unaffordable for residents working in 85 out of 88 in-demand jobs. Dans les centres urbains et dans les petites villes, les Canadiennes et les Canadiens qui n'ont pas les moyens d'acheter continueront de mettre de la pression sur un marché de logements locatifs déjà affaibli. Et pour ceux qui dépendent des log logements subventionnés pour joindre les deux bouts, le problème est encore plus grand en raison des changements de financement fédéraux et provinciaux qui viennent à échéance, certains dans quelques années à peine. Nous sommes aussi préoccupés que vous par le plan du gouvernement fédéral d'éliminer les subventions de loyers indexés sur le revenu pour les personnes qui vivent dans des coopérations, coopératives d'habitation. Ici en Alberta, plus d'un millier de familles dépendent de ces subventions Et si le financement n'est pas rétabli, beaucoup de résidents, comme les personnes âgées vivant de revenus fixes, risqueront de se retrouver sans abri. Eh bien, un gouvernement libéral ne laissera pas une telle chose arriver. Our platform will include measures to encourage the construction of new, affordable, purpose-built rental housing. It will outline what we see as a renewed federal role in housing. It will include investments in innovative programs for supportive housing, as well as predictable and sustained new funding for affordable housing. <laughs> Second area of concern, public transit and transportation. We will be looking at ways to enhance and expand investments in public transit and transportation. Our economic well-being relies on our ability to reliably move goods and people. If we fail to meet that challenge, we are failing Canadians. This is especially true in our larger cities, where lack of adequate public transit and worsening congestion are eroding our productivity. In the Greater Toronto Area, for example, that lost productivity is estimated to cost us more than $6 billion a year. But there's more at stake than just lost productivity. The very livability of our cities is threatened when our citizens don't have accessible, affordable ways of getting to and from where they need to go each day. Bien sûr, le transport collectif coûte très cher, vous le savez. Les coûts des projets de transport en commun dépassent presque toujours la capacité des municipalités de les financer seules. C'est pourquoi vous avez besoin de partenaires provincial et fédéral à la table. Un gouvernement libéral réparera la relation fragilisée entre les municipalités et le gouvernement fédéral. Nous investirons plus d'argent dans le transport collectif Et les transports. A Liberal government will invest more money in public transit and transportation. <laughs> the Conservatives announced a plan that sounded like everyone would have access. But in truth, we've all seen that their plan is too big for small cities, too small for the big cities, and the medium-sized cities who thought they were going to be benefiting just found out today that they wouldn't. The federal government has got to stop playing cities against one another. It's time 
for fairness for cities and communities. We will also propose new and innovative ways to mobilize alternative sources of capital, such as pension funds. We will make it easier for municipalities to get shovels in the ground by removing the requirement that virtually every project must go through an onerous P3 screen, a process that too often results in unilateral federal decisions. And we will make sure that, when, that the investment gets to you when you need it, not when it's politically convenient for a federal government to send it your way. And third, speaking of things that can't wait, climate change. When I was responding to the latest federal budget in the House of Commons, I noted that nowhere in that budget not once in over 500 pages, was climate change mentioned. I joke that maybe one has to believe it's actually happening before one bothers to address it. Of course, we all know that climate change is real. The jury is in, especially here in Canada. We're already seeing its effects from drought to coastal erosion, from ice storms to forest fires. Here in Alberta, in just the last five years, we've seen destruction on an almost unprecedented scale. The 2013 floods were one of the costliest natural disasters in Canadian history. Economic losses topped $5 billion, with nearly $2 billion paid out by insurers. The 2011 wildfires near Slave Lake cost upward of 700 million. That same year, the windstorm in Calgary cost an estimated 200 million. And the year before that, half a billion dollars in insurable damages from the hailstorm that hit Calgary. With each passing year, one thing becomes more obvious. Much of the infrastructure that we have now was built for a climate that no longer exists. And the economic impact of these changes will only grow in the future. And adapting to climate change is an expensive proposition. We know, for example, that protecting Toronto's Don River against future flooding will cost a billion dollars. But doing nothing will cost us five times that. Likewise, experts looking at flood mitigation options here in Alberta have called for a series of berms and bypasses that could cost nearly a billion. Sadly, we know all too well that the cost of inaction is much, much greater. When it comes to adapting to climate change, there is a direct connection between readiness and resilience. If we don't make it a priority to build more resilient communities, we are putting our citizens, our environment, and our economy at risk. En d'autres mots, si nous ne faisons pas de l'adaptation au changement climatique une priorité, nous mettons à risque nos citoyennes et nos citoyens, notre environnement et notre économie. Ces défis requiert une réponse concertée et un gouvernement libéral fournira cette réponse. Nous travaillerons avec les provinces, les territoires et les municipalités pour développer un plan d'action global qui nous permettra de mieux nous préparer aux urgences météorologiques et d'y répondre. It's time to build stronger, more resilient communities, to invest in high quality, well-paying jobs, to make sure that we're ready for whatever challenges lie ahead. As municipal leaders, you're already seeing the devastating effects of climate change on your communities. It's time you had a partner in Ottawa willing to A, acknowledge the issue, and B, get serious about preparing 
for tomorrow's climate today. Other countries are already doing it. We can't afford to wait. Fourth and finally, smart cities. Fairness for Canada's cities and communities means a renewed focus on the unique needs of our urban areas, now home to eight out of 10 Canadians. In particular, we need to look at ways to expand the network of smart cities across Canada. Like you, Liberals understand that the future of our communities, and by extension, the future success and prosperity of Canada, relies on the smart adoption and deployment of data and technology. I would even argue that in 2015, it's impossible to have good government without good data. Successful organizations collect data so that they know what is working and what isn't. They set targets, measure progress, assess the effectiveness of programs, report publicly on results, and adjust, renew, cancel, or expand programs based on evidence. That's what successful organizations do. And our federal government has stopped doing it, making your work even more difficult. That's why, if we form government, we will immediately restore the long-form census. We need to give communities all across Canada the information they need to serve residents best. But data is just part of the equation. Canada's present and future prosperity also rests on our ability to attract people and investment from all around the world. And to do that, we need smarter cities. To that end, a Liberal government will also help municipalities fund investments to make better use of data and technology. Greater integration between energy, transportation and IT systems will help cities work better for Canadians. In rural communities, we can and should aim much higher than the government's current broadband access goals. And across Canada, And across Canada, improved wireless and digital technologies can make life easier and businesses more productive. À titre d'exemple, la ville de Québec a bien entrepris le virage de la ville intelligente. Elle a compris les deux principes qui sont à la base de ce concept, la transparence et la création d'une valeur ajoutée pour les citoyens. Québec a su allier innovation et partenariat. Elle puise notamment dans le talent et la créativité qu'on retrouve chez l'Université Laval et elle travaille à développer des solutions novatrices à des enjeux municipaux. Le travail est loin d'être terminé, mais il est bien entamé. De nombreuses municipalités à travers le pays ont amorcé le virage de la ville intelligente J'estime que le gouvernement fédéral a un rôle important à jouer pour appuyer celle-ci. In rural communities, we can and should, and I'm going to repeat this because it's on my teleprompter, aim much higher than the government's current broadband access goals. But municipalities cannot shoulder the burden of ICT investments alone. The federal government must be a strong partner as municipalities prepare for the future. And that need for true partnership is the thread that runs through everything that I've talked about today. Whether it's affordable housing, public transit and transportation, climate change, smart cities, or the way that we prioritize and finance our investments in them, it once again comes back to a new spirit of cooperation, to the quality of relationships 
and the partnerships that need to exist between all orders of government. If there is one thought that I hope you take away from my talk today, it is this, that fairness for Canada's cities and communities is possible. You know we need it. I don't have to sell you on that. I want you to know that, it with, that with the right partner in Ottawa, you will have a real partnership with Ottawa. A partner, a partner that respects your experience and lives up to its responsibilities. A partner that will help you build the modern infrastructure needed to preserve our quality of life, create more good jobs, drive productivity, and keep our economy moving forward. That's what it's going to take to make our communities strong and prosperous places that we're proud to call home. My friends, fairness for Canada's cities and communities is possible. And I'm looking forward to getting that job done together. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Thank you very much.